Greetings and welcome to yet another episode of Outstanding Role Models of Sri Lanka. Today we have Asha DeVos with us and we're going to listen to her story and also reasons as to why you can be inspired by her story. An incredible story of beginning here in Sri Lanka, staying here in Sri Lanka and being a world-renowned scientist, accomplishing great things in such a short time and we know for sure the best is yet to come. Dr. Asha DeVos is an internationally acclaimed Sri Lankan marine biologist, ocean educator, pioneer of long-term blue whale research within the Northern Indian Ocean, and strong advocate for diversity and equity in marine conservation. She is also an adjunct research fellow at the Oceans Institute of the University of Western Australia. She has degrees from the University of St. Andrews, University of Oxford, and the University of Western Australia, but escaped academia to establish her own Sri Lankan-grown non-profit, Oceanswell, Sri Lanka's first marine conservation research and education organization. Her work has been showcased internationally by the BBC, the New York Times, TED, and National Geographic, to name a few. Amongst her many accolades, Asha was listed on the BBC 100 Women 2018 list of the most inspiring influential women from around the world and was named Lanka Monthly Digest Sri Lankan of the Year. In 2019, Asha was named one of the 12 women changemakers by the Parliament of Sri Lanka and in 2020 was awarded the inaugural Maxwell Hannon Award in Field Biology while also being named Scuba Diving Magazine's Sea Hero of the Year. In 2021, Asha was awarded Vanita Abhimana Lifetime Achievement Award and the Talberg SNF Eliasson Global Leadership Prize. Asha, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Lovely to be here. Very excited. So I'm extremely excited about this because I've been following your career and what you've done. Uh, we met about three, four years ago mm -hmm. and things were starting to wrap up, but then you've just gone all out. Tell me about the beginning of this journey, that little girl Asha when you were starting, when did you really start saying, I want to be a scientist, I want to do what I'm doing right now? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think all of us as kids have dreams, right? And I think uh, we have a lot of self-belief as children, um, but then we get older and then people introduce the word limiting and then it becomes a self-limiting belief. But lucky for me, that wasn't the case. So I was this six-year-old little wild child, right? Like a little monkey, like barefoot, running around, climbing trees. I, we had, uh, we didn't have normal pets like dogs and cats in our house. We had, you know, caterpillars in jars that were turning into beautiful butterflies. We had scorpions giving birth. This was the childhood I had, you know. Um, I'm very, obviously very lucky to have had that because I saw science unfold in front of my eyes. And to me, it was just this magnificent thing. And, you know, just being in nature all the time on our bicycles, cycling everywhere, falling off trees. For me, that, that sense of adventure, you know, that like, I don't know where I was going to go that day, you know, mm -hmm. that was huge. And I think those kind of, those little feelings, those senses, um, it was something that I held on to. And, you know, going through, my parents would bring back National Geographic magazines all secondhand, you know, they'd be like, oh, here, like a random copy from like the 80s or whatever. And you flip through and you see all these people going to these incredible places, you know, and I'm thinking, I want to be that person. I want to go where no one else has ever gone and see what no one else will ever see, right? Mm. Um, and I will be honest, none of those people looked like me, mm. right? None. But because I didn't have the self-limiting belief, I didn't think it was not possible. Mm. I was just like, I can do this, I will do this. And so for me, it all started off with the dream to be an adventurous scientist, mm. right? Um, but then I fell in love with water. My parents sent us for swimming because obviously as a safety measure, and I just thought, wow, this is magnificent, right? You like get in, you, it's just, you know, your body is supported by this water. Um, I would see the ocean every day, but you know, culturally, we didn't spend that much time at the ocean and the beach, like, you know, mm. recreationally or anything, but it was that intrigue, mm. you know, I was drawn towards like, I knew this has to be something more. It wasn't just a tank of water. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, that curiosity that I was allowed to have as a kid, um, that sense of trust that my parents placed in me that, you know, yeah, you can do what you believe you need to do for yourself, right? Um, and then they introduced us to lots of people. So Sir Arthur C. Clarke, you know, renowned science fiction writer, inventor, undersea explorer, he moved to Sri Lanka to dive the wrecks that litter our shorelines. Mm. And I would sit with him after swims sometimes and, you know, listen to his stories and he'd tell me these stories, which like, to date, I don't know if they're true, 
but they would be like abrupt endings. He'd be like that big brown skin that went past. He was just testing out his next book. Did, probably. Yeah. And I was like, yes. And yeah. then he'd be like, uh, my dive had to end. I'm like, what? Who tells like a child, like a half a story, right? So I think all of these things were like the curiosity, the sense of like wonder, mm. that idea that, you know, I could, it was possible and why not me, was something that was very strong within me. And I think that's kind of where it all began. Wow. That's you can just sense the passion, the excitement from the child to now. And it's not like you lost it halfway through. Mm -mm. <laughs> and you were not limited as a child and now you're not limited as an adult. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we're talking as for these outstanding role models is you had to, it was not just passion. Yeah. You had to become competent at what you're doing. Yeah. You had to work hard, you had to build skill. Tell about the grind, tell about how hard you had to work to get where you are. Yeah, so, ah, uh, my gosh. So you can imagine right now I'm, uh, you know, 17 years old. Um, everyone's making decisions about what to do with their lives, right? At 17, somehow you're supposed to magically know um, what your, the rest of your life will look like. And I'm at the point where I'm like, I'm like resolute that I'm going to be a marine biologist, right? Uh, because it had adventure, science and salt water. So for me, perfect. I had my career carved out. But you know, uh, you know, when we grew up at a time at, when people didn't know what, what a marine biologist was. So I'd mm. tell all these aunties and uncles, they'd be like, Ane puta, great, wonderful. What are you going to do with that degree? Mm. How are you going to make money? Mm. There is no scope for it here, right? And I was like, what? I was very confused because uh, this is an island, right? If anyone has a job, it's me, it's yeah. marine, right? So I, you know, like, the, and then they would say, oh, you have to go abroad to study because you can't study here. That means you won't come back. It was, that was the, that's what they believed. Mm. So a lot of no, a lot of naysaying, that's mm. what I faced right at the start. You know, I hadn't even got off the ground and people were telling me I couldn't. Mm. But for me, there were a few things. One was that I just kept saying, I'll carve my own niche. I had no idea what I was going to do, but I knew I could do it, right? The second thing was I knew that my goal in life was to come back and serve Sri Lanka. So I was going to go to bring back. Mm. That's what I was going for, to bring back to my country and to serve my country. And the other thing was I had parents who just said, do what you love and you'll do it well. And I always say, I don't think they knew what I was going to do. Mm. But they just, you know, had the confidence that I knew what I needed. And I think that was the greatest gift, you know. Um, so, you know, that's just one example. But my goodness, the journey has been constantly, you know, people, people who never thought to do it themselves, suddenly waking up and being jealous, right? Um, trying to get in my way, trying to stop me, uh, to, you know, just being a woman in the field, right? People assume it's a man's job, which is mad because all I'm doing is caring for the oceans and you don't have to be a specific gender or a specific, you know, come from a specific background at a particular age to care for something, right? I care for the oceans and that's what marine conservation is about. Uh, so people constantly tell me, oh, it's a man's job, you shouldn't be doing this, to, you know, just everything is like, for some reason, everyone feels they need to tell me what I can't do. But, you know, I'll be honest, that's what's fueled me. Mm. Every time someone says you yeah. can't, I'm like, thanks very much. That's just something else I'm going to prove you wrong on, you yeah. know. Um, so it's just, you know, but it, it is, it's a grind. And OK, just to give you an example, I, after my uh, first degree, I wanted experience. Right now, I'd learned things in textbooks. So now, how do you, what is a marine biologist? And I wanted to get some field experience so um, I decided to uh, go to New Zealand because that was the only country that would let me go because Sri Lankan passport uh, it was an open-ended sort of like I was like can I just go for six months right and you know with our passport it's difficult so they were very generous they said fine we'll give a six-month visa I couldn't afford to fly so I actually I was in Scotland doing my undergraduate at St Andrews I worked in the summer as a uh, tatty roger. Basically, that's a person who digs rotting potatoes out of potato fields, right, to save money. Disgusting job, hot sun, Scotland hardly has sun, but somehow the time I was working, it was very sunny, <laughs> collecting these rotten potatoes that are going squishy in our hands. From that, I saved enough money to get to New Zealand, got to New Zealand, realized I didn't have money to stay in a four bedroom house or anything like that. So I lived in a tent for the most part of six months. Um, you know, just so that I could get this experience, yeah. you know. So the list is endless, but yeah. everything 
I knew was taking me close to where I wanted to be. This is amazing. So somebody, I want to be like Dr. Asha. I want all that. I want the. I want the words. I want the recognition. I want the. Wait, say in a tent. Yeah, yeah, right. Potatoes. What's all this about? Yeah. What's, I don't want all that. But that's what. That's the resilience that you need. This doesn't yeah. happen overnight. No. And so many people say no, and the amount of hurdles that you yourself, you know, coming from this country, not having privilege and wealth and yeah. passport and all those limitations, being a woman, being told what you can do and you can't, mm -hmm. do, but still you're here, mm -hmm. and that's incredible. So I just want to thank you for for all what you do. But at the same time, I, I, I've seen this amazing character and integrity in you. Uh, one of the reasons is obvious. One thing that really stands out, what you just said, is wherever I go, however much I gain, I'm coming back. Mm. Yeah. Three million Sri Lankans have left Sri Lanka, folks, and more people are lining up to leave. You can have make ten times, maybe twenty times more money than you can make here. You'll have a more s you know, supportive environment or whatever. But you're here. Mm -hmm. Talk to, that's, that's character, that's integrity, knowing where you started, yeah. your country, your oceans, your people. Talk to us about that. So I think I get this like wild love for Sri Lanka from my father. Um, my father was an, is an architect but also a monument conservator. So he restored the Jethavana mon monastery complex, he restored the Gaul fort over decades. And I would, you know, as a kid, our trips were basically, my mom would quickly put us in the back of the car and we would go and just spend time on these sites with him. And, you know, I think subconsciously I recognized, you know, this man had so much commitment for something that wasn't giving back to him. It was a much greater cause. It was for the sake of our country. Right? He wanted to restore these spaces, not because he was benefiting. He wants our, the next generation, the generation after that to know where our heritage comes from, who we are, right? So I think that like really rubbed off on me. And his work was also as a conservationist. He was protecting buildings, right? So our natural, uh, our cultural heritage versus the natural heritage, which is what I protect. So that I think was strong in me as a kid. Um, my mom's not Sri Lankan, but you, if you meet her, you'd think she was born and brought up in this country as so, well. Like she's full on thousand percent Sri Lankan as well right so that identity was strong from the time I was young and you know I just this country is incredible there is so much to offer if you don't give up on it right I'm not saying it's perfect I recognize the chaos I recognize what's going on here it makes me sad because we have potential yeah. but if every single one of us gives up then then what yeah. you know and to me there's never been one minute. So I, I was away for you know about 14 years doing all my degrees, um, working abroad, and everything was about like, okay, I want to gain a bit more because then I can take more, right? Take back more. That was my mindset. You know, at, I came to a point, I was doing a postdoc in California, so a research position. And one day I turned to the guys I was working with and they, I was like, it's time. And they said, for what? I said, I'm going home. They said, well, we're going to raise more funding for you to stay here for a couple of years. I said, no, nope, this is my moment. Mm. And they said, what is it? I said, you know, I wanted to make sure that I had built enough networks and support across the world mm. so that you could find me anywhere I was. Mm. And that was my goal, right? Why? Because I, don't want to, I didn't want to come back to Sri Lanka and stagnate and get frustrated. But if I had a big enough support network, I felt that no matter where I was, I would still be able to have those connections that could make me better, be the best version of myself, to produce and do more for my country. Um, and so, yeah, I moved back. I haven't had, I mean, it's been six years that I've been here, not a regret. Mm. I wake up every morning thinking about what, what can I do? Mm. I have a role to play in this country too. I can be frustrated, I can be angry, I can wake up and think I can leave, I can get a better job, I can, I can go abroad. I'm sure I'd get a position, I'm sure. I mean, it sounds very overconfident, but I'm sure I will. But you know what? I have a role to play in the history of this nation. Mm. And that is why I'm here. Wow, well said. And that's exactly what we need young people to think right now. Oh, yeah. Is we have to change things around. This is a generation. It's mm -hmm. on your shoulders that we're going to have to build. And so now talking about, you know, first of all, congratulations on the award you recently won. Thank now, you. You may ask congratulations for what now? There have been a lot, <laughs> lot of things going on. But, but this recent award is pretty significant. I want you to talk about that. Because obviously that's another thing. Because you come with all these qualifications and then you could look at ways of, okay, how do I just find it, make it comfortable for myself? Do mm. a few consulting things here, do a few teaching things here. But you're trying to some, do something very visionary, mm. something way outside the box, what the country needs. You're mm. pioneering something here. 
How many people apply for this? 4,000 people or something? I think there were 2,400 nominees from 140 countries. So, yeah, okay. lots of people. So tell us about that and the vision that you have. What do you want to do here in Sri Lanka? So, for me, uh, I mean, this uh, just to, so people know, it's this Tolberg's SNF Eliasson Global Leadership Award. Um, so, I was nominated anonymously. I don't know who nominated me. Um, and, you know. Me, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? That, I mean, that's the other thing I want, you know, like people to remember is that you don't work for awards, right? I, I mean, you just work. And the recognition comes, right? So those are like high fives Key and a long point. marathon. A lot of young people these days are trying to position themselves for yeah. the award and not focus on the vision. No. So go ahead. So it's the vision, right? Yeah. So for me, I think everything's a marathon. These awards are amazing because they kind of give you that energy, right? They remind you that you're on the right path. They're a high five on a very long marathon, right? But you don't stop, no. Once you get it, you're not like, ah, now I'm going to retire. I mean, I'm not even halfway through my journey. So this award is particularly exciting because I'm a scientist, I'm trained as a scientist, but it recognizes me as something more than just a scientist, mm. right? Um, it recognizes this work that I've been trying to do for years now, which is really about making specifically marine conservation a much more inclusive space. Mm. And traditionally, it's been very exclusive. It's been seen as, you know, that's what the people in, you know, the West do or the developed world or the global North, right? But for me, you know, 70% of our coastlines are in the developing world, but representation at the global stage is nothing, mm. right? I might be like a lone voice talking on behalf of all those coastlines. I've like carved my way into this space because we need to be there at the table making decisions, mm. right? But I can't do it on my own, right? I mean, the ocean is vast, it's huge, right? We need a giant team. We can't have that giant team unless we're being very inclusive, right? Equitable. Right? Recognizing that everybody has something to contribute. You don't have to be a marine biologist or marine conservationist. You can be an accountant, you can be a baker, you can be a, a mother. You still play a role in protecting our oceans that keep us alive. Right? So, you know, I, I particularly fight against this whole colonial mentality of science where people from outside, foreigners um, from the developed world will come. They'll come and see our countries as exotic countries with big conservation problems, they'll do research and they'll leave. They haven't invested in the infrastructure, they haven't invested in uh, the local capacity, right? So when they go, it cripples what's going on on the ground, right? So there may be projects going on, but those don't get any recognition and it breaks the system. It's not sustainable, no. If we have that problem again, we have to call people across the world. What? We have talent. Talent is equally distributed, but opportunity isn't. And that's my focus, my focus is, how do I create that opportunity? I want my goal in life is that every coastline should have a local hero, mm. right? So for me, I see myself as an opportunity creator. I'm all about opening doors and I want people to just rush past mm. because there are people with way more talent than me. Mm. But I know what I can do and that is make space for those people the doors. to do great things. Yeah. That was I think the very first conversation we had many years ago where I was just amazed. Here is a world-class scientist but at the same time, you, you, you move with compassion to create opportunity for people. That's a, mm. you're, you, you see talent and you want to make sure it happens. You say, how can I get to this region? I want to start, talk to kids in the east, in the north. And you could just do something in Colombo. But mm. you're passionate about everybody. Yeah. And, and you're trying to create opportunity. So for young people out there, uh, just quickly, now that we're on the hook, how do they get in touch with you? How, how can they be part of this journey? How do they be part of this team? Yeah. Revolutionize the space. Yeah, so one thing is, um, you know, social media because I think it's very accessible. We try to, we're trying more and more also to translate our material so that we're kind of reaching even further. We've got lots of volunteers who've just volunteered to translate for Single and Tamil, so that'll make it much easier for us. So Oceanswell ORG on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, and then my personal uh, accounts are Asha Divorce. Um, so th those, those are the easy ways to get in touch and we do create opportunities, we have volunteer opportunities sometimes in the field but sometimes also remotely, you know, but also just get on the journey, come for our discussion groups. Once a month I have what we'd call a science journal club for the public, right? My goal is, I'm not interested in just talking to scientists, I think everybody needs to like delve in the magic of what our oceans are, what they do for us, like there's so many I mean, so many exciting things about it, right? And I want everyone to know. So just, I create as many opportunities as possible for people to get on board, get involved, 
and just to learn so that they can recognize the role they too can play and how they can be part of the solution and not just part of the problem. Yeah, we'd love to see more young people and a lot of the Sri Lanka United students getting involved. We have an entire month in our year where students are supposed to be involved in environmental engagement and maybe that can be their life purpose mm -hmm. and I, I hope that many will join. Uh, I, I kind of want to come up to the conversation of your f vision for the future. Mm. For, for what you're doing here in Sri Lanka, what's the ultimate, you said, ocean hero in every coastline, all that. But, and then also for the country. Mm -hmm. As a scientist who is passionately in love with Sri Lanka and wants the best for Sri Lanka, 20 years down the line, what should we achieve? What should we have? I want Sri Lanka to be the marine sustainability hub of the world. That is kind of this big vision. And people like the naysayers when I was 17, I'm sure there are people out there watching right now, watching us and thinking, she's nuts. Nah. If you don't dream big, you don't achieve big. If you think that, please do write to her, that will motivate her. More. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I love hearing uh, from young people. And you know, you don't have to be like a marine scientist. You know, I have so many young people who write to me and be like, you know, I, I'm in a completely different field. But you know, hearing what you've done means I know I can do it. And that, I'll tell you, yeah. that to me is the greatest thing. On a personal level, I want everyone to see me and be like, she's just like me. You know, there are pictures of me sweaty in my shorts after run. There's so many people who go for runs. I'm just like you, right? I'm, a, you know, there's so many versions of me and I want all to see, people to see me, all those versions and recognize I'm human. I was, I am made of the same things. I wasn't born with a scuba tank on my back. Everything I've got today, everything I've done today, I have literally created from scratch, right? So that's really important. I want that, that message to go up because I want everyone to recognize it's possible for them. I'm not special, right? But for me, the vision is really like, I want a whole generation of marine conservationists, marine biologists, marine scientists, conservationists in general, and self-believers to emerge from this country, to recognize they have a place, that there are people opening doors, but it's up to them to take, to walk through those doors. I can only hold it, yeah. right? I'm not gonna be able to hold their hands and hold the door, that's difficult, but I want them to see the door open. I want them to run through it, to recognize what they can do, right? I want to change the model of how we define people in this country. What makes you a good person? What makes you a bad person? Some of our metrics of success are terrible. What you wear, whether you're married, none of that counts. Right? when you want to contribute to a greater cause. Um, and I want people, the world to look at Sri Lanka and be like, wow, this is a nation that we didn't even think knew what marine science, marine conservation, marine biology was about. But today they are the leaders and I want that to be the case. Now that's a vision worth pursuing and we wish you all the very best. Thank you very much. You're a treasure for this country and I know you're Thank a true you. role model to a lot of young people. And uh, that's why the story is going to go and dubbed in Singhala and Tamil and we're hoping that many will engage. Uh, so we wish you all the very best. Thank you. And thank you for everything you do. Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the recognition. And I just want everyone out there to know that you and me, we're just, just normal people. And we're not special. There's no magic, you know. But if you believe you can do it, if you see us and you think, you know, I want someday to have this conversation like this. I want to be able to do this. I want to contribute to my nation. Never forget that you can. Yes, you can. Ordinary people doing extraordinary work to build a phenomenal nation. These are the outstanding role models of Sri Lanka. We're proud and privileged to have them in our country. And we're proud and privileged for the leadership that they give to a generation to transform our country. Thank you for watching. Join us again next week.